to questions, to listed questions to the Minister of Finance and Personnel. As I understand, well, I believe this is the Minister's first question time. Can I uh, congratulate him on his appointment? I'm sure the members will recognise it's your first question time. Um, but indeed, I must also inform the House that question 10 has been withdrawn. I call Mr. Basil McRae. Principal Deputy Speaker, it's an honour to ask the first question uh, to the new Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, and can I thank the member for his question. When a fixed charge receiver is appointed, they take control of the management of a property, usually when a borrower has defaulted on payment. The fixed charge receiver acts as an agent of the borrower, only being liable for the rates when a property that they are managing is, first of all, occupied, generates rent payable to the receiver, or where one of the following applies. Non-domestic properties, the net annual value is below £1,590, and the frequency of rent payments is less than quarterly, and also domestic properties when the capital value is under £150,000. Mr. McRae for supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, earlier today I spoke to officials from the Land and Property Services and they informed me that perhaps two a week are coming before them and that almost all of these end up in bankruptcy at 75% or payment. There seems no way to reach an accommodation that would actually help people uh, to re retain their businesses and I am quite sure that he would join with me in wishing that we could find some way of reducing the cost of the public exchequer, but also making sure that we have a viable property sector. I thank the member for his supplementary. And obviously, uh, my predecessor and all, also my colleague and deputy have discussions, have had discussions with the banks around a number of issues, and I indeed tend to meet with my colleague. Uh, the Minister for the Department of Enterprise and Investment very soon, and it would be our intention again to meet with the banks, and the concern that is raised by the member is something that I would be quite happy to pursue with them. I am also quite happy to meet the member uh, to discuss this issue further, because I am aware of the interest that he has taken on this and a number of other issues related. Mr John McAllister. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number two. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. And the OECD conducted a benchmarking analysis of how our public sector compares against international settings, assessed against three overarching themes, improving strategic approaches, improving engagement with people, and improving operational delivery. They also made recommendations on six targeted core studies. They, they were improving educational outcome for looked after children, problem-solving justice, governance of public procurement, delivering social change framework, health service commissioning and streamlining regulation. I, along with my officials, am currently considering the draft report. Well, Mr McAllister for supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Grateful to the Minister for his reply. Um, I am concerned, Minister, about the delay. The report was originally it talked about being published last November. Uh, we're now in late January. That has not happened. Is he also concerned that uh, the, the failure that the executive had in building in a wider reform of the public sector is making any of these things very difficult to deliver? In voluntary exit scheme, he's probably only going to take out about 10,000 people out of the public sector as opposed to the targeted uh, 20. And across uh, the sectors like health and education, getting the reforms that he needs and linking it in uh, to this report is proving very difficult. Is that a major concern of the Minister? For his supplementary, and obviously I would want to see progress made in relation to this issue. However, I will say this to the member, that the finalisation of the report does not mean acceptance of all of its recommendations. And what I have to do is that I have to seek the views of my other ministerial colleagues. Uh, the views of ministers will be sought and the action plans developed for those areas agreed by ministers. Currently, what we are doing is trying to uh, make an assessment uh, of the, uh, the report. I will then be sharing that report with my ministerial colleagues and then it is my intention uh, to have it signed off and then for it to be made public. 
Well, Mr. Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and uh, thank the Minister for his answers, and we wish him well in his new post. We are, as has been mentioned, we are very much aware of the voluntary exit scheme, which has been in place for some time for civil service. Can the Minister give us an update on the progress of reform within the public sector to date? And Thank you, Member, for the supplementary. And obviously, it does. The issue in relation to the voluntary exit scheme plays an important role in terms of ensuring that we were able to get to the end of this financial year in a better financial place than where others anticipated that we would be. By the end of January, over 2,410 Northern Ireland Civil Service staff will have left under the voluntary exit scheme, with a further 404 due to leave at the end of March. Overall, these exits will deliver a pay bill saving this financial year of around £24 million. While the scheme was initially intended to end in March 16, six departments, DFP, DE, DECAL, Department of Justice, DSD and DRD, have confirmed that they wish to facilitate a limited number of exits and make around 220 offers through a fifth and final tranche. Those selected for tranche five will receive an offer no later than the end of February, with uh, exits occurring no la later than the end of June. Applicants who do not receive an offer by the end of February will receive notification that they have not been selected. This will signal the formal closure of the VAES scheme. Uh, and there are no plans at further to introduce a further scheme. I would conclude by saying that overall, all of the five tranches uh, are completed. The scheme should generate approximately £86 million in annual pay bill savings at a cost in terms of compensation of around £90 million. Well, Mrs Dolores Kelly. I could ask the Minister uh, question three, please. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I will answer uh, questions three and six in relation to this uh, question. This issue cannot be resolved by the Department of Finance and Personnel uh, acting alone and will require executive consideration, firstly because it is a cross-cutting issue, secondly because there is, no legal, there is no equal pay issue and therefore no legal liability. It would require legislation to provide a route for payment, executive discussion and agreement would be required for financial provision to be made. And thirdly, resolving this issue would require significant funding, and given the already challenging departmental budgets, the executive would need to agree where the money would come from. Mrs. Dolores Kelly for a supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, I must say I'm very disappointed in your answer. There was a debate some months ago in this House where I think there was agreement reached that, and a recognition that whilst there was no uh, legal obligation, there was a moral obligation. And I understood, uh, Minister, that. Uh, that there had been a paper submitted to the executive uh, to, which was suggesting at least this is the, uh, the, uh, the uh, information that those who are affected have, that they were to get a £6,000 one-off payment. But that is being held up and has not been presented or tabled at the executive. I would ask for the Minister's comments on that. Well, I am well aware and I have read the debate that took place in this House in relation to this particular matter. And I would like to see progress made in relation to this particular issue. However, I, I as Minister for Finance cannot get away from the court judgment that there was in relation to this issue. And so therefore, the court has made a particular ruling, given the fact that this had been taken to the courts, and we have a ruling in relation to that. And also, uh, it is an issue given the particular pressure that we are under in relation to the financial position. This will have a considerable cost to uh, the public purse, uh, and it is an issue of concern to me that how we balance that against other demands that there are. And I accept that uh, my predecessors going back as far 
as the then Minister, Minister Wilson, uh, did all express. Uh, Minister Wilson's view was the legal position. I think uh, then Minister, the latest in terms of Minister Hamilton was that there was a moral argument. And many of those comments are comments that I can concur with. However, I would take the view that we still are in a position in relation to how we would get a resolution to what is a very difficult uh, situation. Well, Mr. Jim Mallister. Mr. Surely the success of today is adding to the scandal of the manner in which these uh, civil servants have been treated. Your predecessor told this House that in June 2014, just coming up in two years, a paper had been submitted to the executive with a view to plotting a way forward. Uh, has that paper never reached the executive? And given there are now supposed to be mechanisms where you can force an issue onto the executive table. Has that device not been used? And if it hasn't, will the minister today commit to use it? Thank the member for his supplementary. I repeat what I said in relation to uh, the importance of the issue. And it is unfortunate that we are in this position in relation to uh, this particular sector of uh, public employees. I have to say that I still, having read uh, part of the judgment in relation to this issue. Uh, we will be having a discussion with my officials, and the member can appreciate that in this particular issue I have taken up post. It is a matter that I am well aware is in my entry, uh, and it is an issue that I believe needs to be revisited, and I give the House a commitment that that is an issue that I will endeavour to pursue over the next coming weeks. Call Mr Gordon Lyons. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, could the Minister uh, outline to us any of the potential risks or implications uh, that there are in relation to this issue uh, in regards to the rest of the, the wider civil service? Thank the member for his supplementary. Obviously, there is always an issue in relation to risk when you come to the payment of uh, 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 an issue like this. As these staff suffered no equal pay detriment during their service, there is, as we have repeated, no legal liability. In addition, it is not possible to construct a business case for a payment for the moral argument uh, that is within the terms of the managing public money Northern Ireland. Therefore, any payment would be highly vulnerable both to judicial review and criticism by various audit bodies, including the PAC. An ex gratia payment cannot be made without legal cover, and that would need to be put in place. If payment were made to these staff, other staff in different grades or organisations may feel that also they had a moral right to such a particular payment, even though they were also unaffected by the Northern Ireland Civil Service pay settlement. The NICS staff may become unhappy with the original equal pay settlement especially if different amounts or grades receive payment and could result in a new group of disaffected staff. And so the member, I trust, can see, as the House can see, that this is not just a simple issue, and it is not just as simple as getting agreement in terms of the executive. It is also implications for a variety of other elements of the Northern Ireland Civil Service that I have outlined in the answer to the supplementary. Oh, Mr. Ross Hussey. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his responses so far. This matter clearly has been ongoing for a long time. In fact, I think it was one of the, the, the main issues during the last election. Uh, many of these affected asked this question. Mr. Allister asked the question, has a paper been submitted to the executive, either being prepared by yourself or by one of your colleagues in the past? So I asked the question, has a paper been submitted to the executive in relation to this issue? A member for a supplementary, and when the first executive paper was circulated by a previous DFP minister, it received a number of responses from other ministers. However, not all ministers have yet responded, including that of the Office of First and Deputy First Minister. Well, Mr. Sean Rogers. For Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank the member for his question. The Northern Ireland Executive committed to introduce a devolved. 12.5% rate of corporation tax from April 2018 as part of the Fresh Start Agreement. The signing of this 
memorandum of understanding with Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs is a further concrete step towards that. The memorandum of understanding will allow for timely development of the IT and administrative systems necessary for the successful implementation and operation of the Northern Ireland regime. A project board is being established with the role of overseeing this important work. This will include representation from my department, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, Her Majesty's Treasury and the Northern Ireland Office. Mr Rogers, first supplement. Could I thank the Minister for his answer and wish him well in his new role. With his previous experience in education, I'm sure he'll endeavour to get his sums right. Uh, just, just, just on the, on the cooperation tax, you know, the success of the, of the of a reduction in the cooperation tax will depend on uh, creating create, will the, the job, creating many, many jobs. But that will only that will only be happen if our young people have the right skill set. Have you concerns about the, the, the skills gap in terms of ensuring that we have enough young people for the jobs when cooperation tax is reduced? Uh, thank the member for his uh, supplementary and also his best wishes. Uh, I think uh, I said to somebody the other day, the first thing that I had to acquire when I took this post was a big calculator. The second one now is how to be able to use it. So uh, I realise the challenge that there is for me in this role. However, I will endeavour to do my job to the best of my ability. And the member does raise a very valid point, and that is in relation to ensuring that while we have set the date and we have set the rate, that we do have in place all the other component parts which enables us to maximise the best outcome in relation to corporation tax. And one of those elements is particularly in relation to skills. That is why last week uh, in the budget I uh, indicated that while we have already agreed £5 million in, in terms of the skills agenda, that it is my intention to bring forward proposals in relation to an additional £20 million uh, when we have further consideration in the June monitoring round after the new mandate uh, comes into operation. Because I do believe that we need to ensure that all the component parts are in place to maximise the benefit for corporation tax for Northern Ireland. Let's be under no illusion. Corporation tax, and there were those who were brought to the party late, and there were those who were probably seen uh, as Damascus Road convert, uh, converts in relation to this issue. I believe that in terms of how Northern Ireland can move forward, and we can build and we can give a future to our young people and to the economy, that corporation tax will play a, a vitally important role in relation to that, and skills is equally a very important element of that equation. Well, Mr Ian McRae. Mr Speaker, and I, I join with the previous um, member, and certainly I'm encouraging the um, skills gap is, is, is dealt with to ensure that any the evolution of corporation tax can be um, you know, covered in that sense. But in respect of the regime that the Minister has referred to, can, can he outline what the, um, how much that work will cost, including any ongoing administrative costs of, of the regime? Well, obviously, with uh, uh, any particular scheme, there will always be uh, a particular cost. And in terms of the memorandum of understanding, we've built in uh, to the budget uh, an allocation of money that will ensure that uh, we deal with that. I think it's somewhere in the region of, of £4 million. Uh, and uh, we clearly have to make sure that when it comes to the implementation of corporation tax that we have uh, our IT uh, in the right place and that we have aligned all the other elements. And that is why, uh, in reference to the project board, which will meet uh, very soon, indeed, I think my officials uh, intend to meet either this week or next week uh, with our colleagues uh, from Her, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs and also Her Majesty's Treasury and the Northern Ireland Office, so that what we will endeavour to do is put in place the regime that will deliver uh, the corporation tax as we have envisaged, because we have set the date, we have the rate, and now we need to make progress in uh, preparation for that. Call Mr. Alex Maskey. I can pray last thank you, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Could I uh, thank the Minister for his answer so far? Could I ask the Minister in furtherance of the idea of maximising both opportunities and benefits in relation to the devolution of uh, corporation tax? Can the Minister give an assurance that he will continue to negotiate and explore with the British Treasury 
that secondary benefits, like for example income tax coming from what's projected anywhere up to 35,000 jobs, could uh, be at least in part kept here in the north? Yes, I, I want to ensure that we have covered all our bases in relation to this issue. And I think it follows on from what I said earlier in relation to the preparation for the introduction of corporation tax. And I'm keen uh, now having taken up post to ensure that we have given consideration to all the possible benefits uh, in terms of this issue. This is something that is, has been described as a game changer in Northern Ireland. It, is, it has had been described in various ways. However, I remain very focused, and I think uh, my executive colleagues remain focused on this issue, that what we do will be done in the best interest of the economic challenges that we face, the economic circumstances that we are in, and that Northern Ireland continues to benefit from a wide variety of benefits that come from the introduction of corporation tax. Call Mr. Roy Beggs. Deputy Speaker, we need to um, attract new foreign and direct investment and encourage new uh, investment from our existing companies so, to, so that additional corporation tax is raised rather than costs being incurred in the block grant uh, at that start date. So is the minister satisfied there is sufficient urgency both from his department and indeed from other departments in promoting the advantages that will exist here so that this additional corporation tax will be raised to benefit the community? Yes, I, I think uh, there, there is. Uh, and, uh, we have started on this road, and I think we need to keep the focus. And I know as Finance Minister, I will be keeping the, the pressure on to ensure that given the work in relation to the project board, that we'll have to work out the, the modalities around uh, the, the following on from the me, uh, Memorandum of Understanding. Uh, and I understand that uh, we will have the First and the Deputy First Minister who will be going to the United States uh, soon uh, and a key component part of the message that they will be bringing to Nor uh, for those in the United States is that Northern Ireland, uh, when uh, 2018 comes, will have a corporation tax of 12.5%. I think that's a good message to be sending out to the United States and to the wider uh, economic uh, world. And I think, as far as my colleague in Delhi is concerned, we will continue to ensure that it plays an important role in the issue of in, uh, encouraging foreign direct investment into Northern Ireland. Call Ms. Claire Sugden. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number five. Uh, thank the member for her question. I have no plans nor proposals to uh, change the rating of large charities and residential homes. My department, however, is currently undertaking a wide-ranging review of all non-domestic rate support to help the new executive to decide what changes are needed uh, to the non-domestic rating system to make it fit for purpose. Uh, this process involves asking stakeholders uh, in all sectors to produce evidence to justify their existing support provision, which is not the same thing as signalling an intention to change policy in any particular area. Sugden for a supplementary. Um, I thank the Minister for his uh, response. Um, I believe that the gaps in the current system have led others to make up that shortfall, um, which I do believe discourages investment in town centres. Um, equally, I don't wish to see that burden actually passed on to the community and voluntary sector. So could I ask the Minister, where is the balance so that occupiers aren't incurring an unfair rates bill every April? Well, I think when it comes to uh, the issue of rates, uh, we always get uh, a differing views. And, and the difficulty that I have, uh, and in fact it's the difficulty that the rating system has, is that if you take money from this hand, you have to find it in this hand. And that is, uh, there are many, many organisations uh, right across Northern Ireland who can make uh, a very valid argument in terms of their own particular set of circumstances. However, we have to balance all of that against ensuring that we have a system which is fair. And uh, I am aware of the uh, 
uh, re-evaluation that we had recently and concerns that were raised there uh, and those are issues that are currently uh, there are a number of appeals that are working through the system in relation to that at the moment however I remain focused in terms of this particular element and that is that we have a system which is fair and I think that we have to be cautious in any moves that we make so that we don't have a situation where there are those who are beneficiaries other over and above others Call Mr. Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. The Minister referred just now in that last answer, latter answer to the issue of the current revaluation. Would he be able to update uh, the House or give us an update on the impact that that has had on empty, pre empty retail premises and commercial premises in our towns and cities? Uh, I thank the member for his supplementary, and uh, I assume that the member is referring to what is known as the Lindsay Report, which has just been published uh, last week. Uh, I think the, the information coming out of that report uh, pointed to positive effect of the re-evaluation overall, positive effect particularly uh, in the city here uh, on Donegal Place, uh, Northern Ireland's uh, uh, premier shopping street, as it would, has been described. The rebalancing of rates burdens towards out-of-town centres without detrimental effect on their vacancy rates. So those, those are points that have been made in the report that was published last week. And I'll just give you uh, one of the quotes from it. Uh, and it said that the adoption of the rates re-evaluation has also delivered much needed help to high streets and the main shopping areas, which has had a positive effect on occupancy levels within these areas. Are there other issues that we still need to look at? Yes, I think that's why in my previous role as Minister for DSD, which has a responsibility for town centres, we have in that department undertaken a considerable amount of investment into our town centres with the, uh, re uh, the rehabilitation uh, provisions, uh, the revitalisation provisions and all the public realm works that have been carried out in many of our towns and, and city centres. And I think all of those collectively points to the fact that this executive is committed to ensuring that our town centres rem remain live and vibrant and places where people want to show up and do business. Call Mr Edwin Poots. Question number seven, Mr Principal Deputy uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Putz, for the question. Uh, the review of the non-domestic rating system is currently out for consultation, a process which officially closes today. I am, however, allowing until the end of the month, uh, as a number of respondents have asked for a little more time to make a submission. It is too early, therefore, to state the final number of responses that will be received. Once all responses have been received and considered thoroughly, my department will report to the Finance Committee uh, on its findings uh, and the findings of the consultation. This will prepare the way for developing options for change and for decisions to be taken by the executive early in the next mandate. Well, Mr. Pooch for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. We all remember uh, Peter Hayne, uh, when he was Secretary of State, introduced um, industrial rates at 30% with an intention of driving that up to 100% uh, pre devolution. Can the Minister give an assurance that it is his intention uh, not to raise industrial rates? As had that decision went ahead, it would have been uh, decimated. Um, our industrial base and ensured that there were thousands of jobs lost in Northern Ireland. I uh, thank the member for his uh, supplementary and reminding us of uh, someone from the past in terms of uh, Mr. Hayne. But uh, the, members will, the member will be aware that my predecessor previous, previously stated on a number of occasions that industrial derating will continue and there are no plans to remove that support for manufacturing. The support provides a valuable boost to manufacturing, a sector that, while growing in Northern Ireland, has not been without its high-profile difficulties in recent months. And I know all too well, in terms of my own constituency, the challenges that there has been in relation to that issue. The relief is of the magnitude of some 58 million per year, helping 4,300 businesses per year, and is already committed to for 16-17 in last week's budget. 
My predecessor said that she intended to retain industrial derating following the business rates review currently being undertaken. I want to confirm to the House today that I support this position and can confirm that there are no plans to remove this support, which I see as key to building and supporting manufacturing in Northern Ireland. As to the wider review, this officially closes today, although some engagement with stakeholders has been undertaken this week at the close of the formal consultation period. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. I call Mr Danny Kennedy. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I uh, congratulate the Minister on his recent elevation uh, and, and, and wish him well. Uh, can the Minister up, up update the House on the number of dormant accounts uh, in existence within his department and the amounts involved? Uh, thank the member for his uh, best wishes uh, and I uh, look forward to working with him uh, in relation to this issue. Uh, in terms of the dormant accounts, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker, some £7.15 uh, million is available for Northern Ireland expenditure under the Dormant Accounts and Building Society Accounts Act 2008. And as part of the budget 15-16, uh, the Executive agreed that these monies should be made available in Northern Ireland throughout, uh, through the establishment of a new fund. Mr Kennedy, for a supplementary. grateful to the Minister for his uh, uh, information. What action uh, does the Minister intend to take uh, to free up uh, these resources, uh, and has he given any consideration as to where these uh, valuable funds may now be directed? And what measures uh, will he put in place to ensure that uh, the issue of dormant accounts will not recur? I thank the member for his supplementary, and indeed I intend to announce a way forward uh, in respect of the fund very shortly. Uh, it is one of those uh, things that I want to ensure that we uh, get up and running. I believe that it will bring uh, benefit to those who uh, will be the recipients of what is a substantial amount of money, uh, given the difficult and unfortunately we always uh, seem to have to use these phrases when it comes to the issue of finance. There are challenging times and there are difficulties that, that many face. However, the funds released by the Reclaim Fund uh, are uh, apportioned according to the Barnett formula as set out in the distribution of dormant accounts money. And as we have said, we have 7.15 million that is available to meet expenditure in Northern Ireland. And I trust to be in a position in the not too distant future, uh, given the short limited time that I have, before PERDA kicks in, uh, we will make an announcement in relation to that fund. Call Mr. Phil Flanagan. I congratulate the Minister on his, his recent appointment. Uh, during a, a TV interview with the BBC last week on the proposed uh, exit from the European Union, the Minister uh, told the interviewer that um, the surplus money that the British Government and others often refer to would be reinvested and retained for use in local communities. Uh, can I ask the Minister whether he has received an assurance of that nature from the British Treasury to enable to make a claim of that nature? I well, thank the, the member for his supplementary. And obviously, we are entering into uh, an unprecedented uh, time of debate and discussion about our future role uh, in the European Union. And I think that uh, it has been made very clear from uh, the First Minister, uh, our Deputy Leader, and others in our party, uh, my party's position in relation to the issue of the European Union. However, what I have to say is that we need to ensure that when there is an ultimate decision made, uh, that decision uh, will be as an outcome and as a result of the referendum, whenever that referendum will be. And I certainly, my role as Finance Minister, will be ensuring that Northern Ireland is to the fore and is being kept to the fore in terms of any discussions that there will be with Her Majesty's Treasury in relation to the monies that will come to Northern Ireland. Mr Flanagan for a supplementary. The, the Minister is doing quite well in uh, not answering the question, uh, as is the, the nature of some Executive Ministers, so I'll, I'll try again. Uh, the Minister specifically said that the monies uh, that are given to local communities through European funding uh, would be retained for use in local communities. Can the Minister confirm whether or not he has received an assurance from the British Treasury with regards to that claim? Well, the Member now has 
specified specifically what he's referring to, and that is money in terms of the, the European funding. The member will know that what I made reference to on that occasion was at the launch of the Peace 4 and the Interreg money. And now there is a commitment in relation to uh, whatever the outcome of the referendum will be in terms of the period that we are in from 14 to 20. And so I have every confidence that those commitments will be maintained and that Northern Ireland won't lose in terms of the monies that have been allocated, the 400 million that has been allocated under Interreg and also under Peace 4. Call Mr. Marcino Milmer. Gurumahira, Friol Askan, Corleogs, Makogar, just Fosta, Lishanara. My congratulations to the Minister, too. I hope you're not regretting it yet, Minister, but congratulations on your elevation. Uh, I wanted to ask your predecessor, Minister Foster, announced a £100 million innovation fund in her budget statement. And that innovation fund uh, was to be focused, for example, on urban regeneration and social housing. Uh, we were briefed on this last week at the committee, at the Finance Committee, Minister. And I just wonder if you would agree that. Uh, this new fund will be a boon and will be a help to companies out there and business people out there who want to uh, fill this funding gap, who want to get the funding to enable them to deliver urban regeneration projects and social housing projects. Well, obviously, what we want to ensure is that whatever fund it is that we have established, and there are a variety of funds that uh, the executive currently has. Uh, in terms of how we spend uh, public money. And what I can give uh, the assurance to the member is this, that uh, those departments which have responsibilities for those funds will be given every encouragement to ensure that they focus in on the priority spend so that we do maximise the outcome from what in many cases is a considerable amount of money. And I know from my time in DSD that when we, for example, used FTC, financial transaction capital, that that is a financial model which can ensure that we give out considerable amounts of money, but in terms of the financial model, in terms of the, the payback, it does give to us in DFP uh, the best possible outcome. And so I can assure the member that we will continue to focus in and around getting the best possible value for the amount of money that is in those particular funds. Mr. Mueller, for a supplementary. Um, uh, uh, thank you, Minister, for that. And I suppose uh, an additional issue then around the funds that we have, and particularly around the, the £100 million innovation fund, which are the NI innovation fund, um, is the ability to attract funds from, from other areas. Uh, I was with the Controller of New York State on Friday morning in New York, and some of our colleagues in the Assembly were there the night before. Uh, but the Controller uh, of New York City and New York State have invested here previously in different ventures. And I wonder if these funds are an ability to not only have our own money, like financial transaction capital money going in, but is there a way to say to pension funds across, across, the, across the globe, it could be the Church of England pension fund, it could be OMERS in Canada, or it could be New York State, is there a way to say to them, let, let, let your money go into our kitty as well, we will manage that for you, and is that something the Minister might, might consider in the future? Well, I thank the member for his supplementary, and uh, it is something that, uh, while I haven't the detail in particular in relation to uh, the, uh, whether or not that is doable, what the member has said, my officials continue to progress towards the establishment of uh, the Northern Ireland Investment Fund, and this fund intends to help boost investment and promote economic growth in Northern Ireland. And I think that those are. Uh, issues that we would all want to see progressed and the intention in the fund is that it will provide loan uh, equity or uh, mezzanine finance to viable local private sector projects that cannot obtain funding from commercial banks. Funding is expected to be provided at a commercial terms to avoid falling foul of state aid rules. But I will come back to the, the member and give him a specific answer in relation to the particular issue that he raises. Call Mr. Trevor Lund. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I also welcome the Minister and congratulate him on his conduct of his first question time? Um, could I ask him when does he intend to publish the Ulster University Economic Policy Centre report into the cost of a divided society? Thank you, and I thank the member for. Uh, his question. He know that, and I, I thank him for his best wishes. Uh, and uh, I do miss 
uh, working alongside my colleague uh, in former days when we were in the Education Committee. However, uh, we uh, now find ourselves in this position. In terms of that particular report, it is my intention that that report will be published very soon. Uh, and uh, there are just some issues that, uh, that I want to satisfy myself in terms of just having come into post. I want to be across well, what is the content and the detail of it, and I trust that in, the, in a few weeks' time we will see that report being uh, put into the public domain. Call Mr. Lund for a supplementary. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I, I know the Minister wouldn't disagree that there is a cost to, to running our divided society on its present basis, even though we don't may disagree about the actual amount of that cost, but would he give a commitment that he would follow through on the implications of this report through shifting resources from separate provision into investment for better quality facilities for the whole community? I know the member did give me congratulations and wish me well. However, he will now be disappointed uh, in me in that uh, I could not uh, give that commitment until I have fully uh, gone through all the details in relation to the report. Because what I will say to the member is that I will give consideration to what is in the report and, uh, as I trust members would expect, to be the case, as far as I am concerned, as the Minister for Finance, that we will endeavour to ensure that we continue to use the monies that we have in Northern Ireland to the best possible way to benefit the people of Northern Ireland. I do take the point that the member makes, and, and it has been a long-standing issue, uh, which has been raised consistently by uh, his party in relation to the duplication, in some cases, of the provision of services. However, I have to say, Going back to our education uh, days, I think that the member knows my view in terms of the way in which we have uh, a duplication of the provision within education, and there are some elements of that sector are unprepared to change, and therefore we have uh, that cost. However, the reality still remains in education that irrespective of who the providers are or the number of providers, we still have the same number of children to educate in Northern Ireland. Question number five has been withdrawn. Mr Dominic Bradley is not in his place. I call Mr Pat Sheehan. And can I also congratulate the, the Minister on his appointment? Uh, I look forward to some battles in the future. Um, the Minister will be aware uh, about the debate around our port duty. Uh, and would he agree with me that it should be made a priority that our port duty uh, powers be transferred completely to the executive here for the incoming mandate. I thank the member for uh, his question and, and also for his best wishes. I have to say I appeared uh, last week before the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee and the member will be aware that they currently are undertaking uh, an inquiry into the issue of the reduction of VAT uh, in relation to the tourism sector. And this is an issue that has arisen. I have to say that I am very conscious of the concerns that have been raised indeed by Her Majesty's uh, Treasury around the cost that it would be to Northern Ireland, uh, and it is estimated that that could be uh, £100 million. Uh, we already have devolved the long haul uh, element of, of the issue uh, of APD uh, in, re in relation to uh, the Newark uh, line. And uh, I think that that is a cost of somewhere in the region of £2 million that we've had to put in. What I want, and I, I've, I'm on the public record just the day after I came into post, what I am not in the business of doing is in creating what could only be described as a sun subsidy uh, for those who might want to go and spend their money in other jurisdictions during the holiday period. What I am interested in doing, and indeed uh, having discussions with my colleague the Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Investment in relation to a particular fund that is to be established, and that is ensuring that we strategically look at those routes which will bring economic benefit to Northern Ireland. I think that remains to be the focus, and that remains for me the issue that needs to be pursued. We have time for a short supplementary, Mr. Sheehan. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sure the Minister is aware that since uh, Airport duty was scrapped in the south. Dublin Airport has seen a, an exponential rise since then. In fact, last year, 25 million, 
and I repeat, 25 million passengers pass through Dublin Airport. Has he anything to say about that? Gorm we have time for a short answer. Yes, obviously that's an issue for the Irish Exchequer and that's the decision that they made. I have responsibility for Northern Ireland in terms of our budget, but let's remember this is an issue which is a known, uh, this is a reserve matter and the focus of our attention has been to make the, the case to Her Majesty's Treasury and to the Chancellor and indeed that will, is what we will continue to do because I believe that the benefit to the, North, to the UK as a, an entire region over the next number of years would be somewhere in the region of 4.7 billion. So I think that the Chancellor has a duty uh, to look at this particular matter and Her Majesty's Government will continue to be pressed uh, on that issue and I await the outcome of the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee report. Time is up. That concludes questions.